Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's indeed a pleasure and honor to be invited to participate in the 14th AOCE International Meeting. On the 30th anniversary of the Endocrine and Metabolic Society of Malaysia. This is my first trip to Malaysia. I've been enjoying visiting uh, Kale very much. Yesterday I had the chance to go up to the uh, sky bridge on the Petronas Towers, which was uh, really quite exciting to see the vistas over KL and, and Malaysia in general. I've only had one problem on this trip, and I haven't been able to find a shopping mall yet. <laughs> and, and raise your hand if you found the shopping mall. <laughs> okay, I'll need to talk with you later. Um, so this is a, uh, a unique presentation. Most plenary talks are either about major advances in clinical research or evidence-based summaries of a, of a topic. This is neither. This is an experience-based presentation. I have the good fortune of working at uh, a large medical institution called Mayo Clinic, founded more than a century ago. These are the Mayo brothers that founded Mayo Clinic, shown in profile here. So we have 48 endocrinologists at Mayo Clinic, so we all get to sub subspecialize within endocrinology. So basically, and I'm a full-time clinician, so every morning, every afternoon, I'm seeing patients with either adrenal or pituitary disorders. So in an average year, I'll see 35 pheochromocytoma patients, and I've been at Mayo Clinic for more than 25 years now. So it's really from that experience that I draw to present this information to you today. First, some background information. Pheochromocytoma is a catecholamine screening tumor, usually localized to the adrenal gland. We think about it a lot, but we don't find it very often. When correctly diagnosed, properly treated, it's curable. When undiagnosed or improperly treated, it can be fatal. Indeed, it's a rare cause of endocrine hypertension. We had a session yesterday on primary aldosteronism, which is more common than most clinicians think, but pheochromocytoma is indeed rare. It occurs equally in men and women, primarily third through fifth decades. Symptoms are present in about half the patients. The other half the patients, the adrenal mass is discovered by accident, an adrenal stenoloma, and the patient may be totally asymptomatic. So when should we suspect our patient may have a pheochromocytoma. A patient with hyperadrenergic spells, so episodes of palpitations, diaphoresis, headache, tremor, pallor. These are discrete episodes. They may last five to 20 minutes, totally go away, just to recur again later in the week. Resistant hypertension, so three drugs, poor control. A familial syndrome that predisposes to fear, such as MEN2, A or B, neurofibromatosis type 1, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, or a sex and dehydrogenase mutation. A family history of pheochromocytoma. An incidentally discovered adrenal mass. All patients with adrenal acetylomas should be evaluated for pheochromocytoma. Hypertension and diabetes, and by that I don't mean just hypertension and diabetes. I mean something unusual. A slender patient with new onset type 2 diabetes or a patient with well-controlled diabetes that all of a sudden, for reasons unexplained, becomes very, develops very poor glycemic control and hypertension. A press response to anesthesia or surgery or angiography. Onset of hypertension at a young age, such as less than age 20. Or a patient with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. These patients don't have the pump to have hypertension, many times don't have the pump to have a spell. There are even patients report in the literature that have had a cardiac transplant, and it's only after the transplant they find out that their patient had a pheochromocytoma. So this is when we should suspect our patient may have pheo. How do we then go about detecting it? It really should be laboratory-based, fractionated catecholamines, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and fractionated metanephrines. Metanephrine, which is the major metabolite of epinephrine, normetanephrine, the major metabolite of norepinephrine. These can now be measured by HPLC or tandem mass spec. At Mayo Clinic, the most reliable case detection strategy is measuring fractionated metanephrines and catecholamines in a 24-hour urine collection. 
If our clinical suspicion is high, then many times we'll add a plasma measurement of fractionated metanephrines. Although it's preferred that our patients receive no drugs when we do our testing, the fact is they can be treated with any antihypertensive drug. As long as you're using HPLC or TANMS spec for your methodology, in other words, these patients can be on labetalol, sotalol, alpha methyl dopa. It doesn't matter what antihypertensive drug. If you're still using the spectrophotometric assays for metanephrines, however, these drugs can interfere. So we never taper any antihypertensive drug when we're going to test for FIO. We leave them on all the drugs that are on that are antihypertensives. The major drug class that causes the problem, tricyclic antidepressants. We give a patient a tricyclic to increase CNS catechols. There's an overflow. You'll pick it up in any urine test and any blood test. So it's true endogenous catechol means. It's usually norepinephrine, and it's metabolized to normetinephrine. They can be elevated four to five-fold above the upper limit of the reference range. In the U.S., we have a drug called Flexeril or cyclobenzaprine, which is also a tricyclic. It's frequently used uh, for conditions such as fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm sure you don't have fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue in Southeast Asia, I hope. But if you do, this is a drug that's commonly used to treat that, and it will cause false positive testing. So if your patient is on a tricyclic or an antipsychotic, if possible, we try to taper and discontinue two weeks before doing laboratory testing. It's also important to recognize that catecholamine secretion can, may be appropriately increased in situations of physical stress or illness. So if the patient comes into your hospital tonight with a hypertensive stroke, should we test for FIO? Yes, but not tonight, not tomorrow. We wait till they're dismissed from the hospital. If you have a patient in the ICU that has blood pressure going from 40 systolic to 300 systolic, back and forth, and you want to test for FIO, we don't have a normal range for catecholamines in the intensive care unit. If you need to know today whether or not that ICU patient has a FIO, the best single test, CT scan, abdomen, and pelvis. Because most of these tumors will be in the adrenal glands, the rest are going to be in the abdomen or pelvis. That's the only time we will go directly to imaging rather than biochemical testing. I just want to review with you some common sense tips, common sense tips on diagnosis. Suppression testing with quantity, provocative testing with glucagon, histamine, and metoclopramide are no longer needed. There's a key link between clinical context and biochemical diagnosis that most clinicians don't recognize. Most clinicians seem to want just a, a cutoff, but the cutoff is only pertinent based on clinical context. I'm going to give you two examples of what I'm talking about. If your patient has paroxysms or spells, the degree of elevation in fractionating metanephrines and catecholamines should be markedly abnormal if your patient has a FIO. In other words, if a FIO is responsible for classic pheochromocytoma spells, then the biochemical tests are always unequivocally abnormal, like more than five-fold elevated above the upper limit of the reference range. What happens in the U.S. many times, I get many emails, I get patients referred all the way across the United States, all the way to Mayo Clinic, they have a 5% elevation in norepinephrine or normetinephrine. They have very impressive spells, which are usually due to panic attack or something else, but they're referred for pheochromocytoma. It's obvious they can't have a pheo. If they had a pheo with dramatic spells, the lab test would be off the charts. I see this written in medical records every now and then, where the clinician will say, well, my patient's being treated with a beta blocker, and it's not having any problems. It's not decompensating. Therefore, they can't have a pheo. Not true. Now, none of us in this room would knowingly give a FIO patient a beta blocker before alpha blockade. We know better. But the fact is, we see more patients come to Mayo Clinic with undiagnosed FIO that are already on a beta blocker and doing just fine. So one of the factors on imaging phenotype is the density of the mass. So on CT, you can determine the density. It's measured in Hounslow units. The, higher, the lower the Hounslow unit score, so like a minus 20 HU, that means it's fatty, more lipid, therefore it's benign cortical adenoma. The higher the Hounsfield unit score, the more lipid, more likely it's going to be a pheo, adrenal cancer, metastatic disease, or a lipid poor adenoma. Just some examples of lipid rich adrenal masses. So you can see how dark these are compared to the liver. See how dark 